like to welcome everyone to our 29th Nook Chat Communities Storing Storytelling Program. Yay. And this is uh, this is through the Nooksack Valley Heritage Center here, based at the Everson Library. And it's hard to believe 29. And we're still up and running. We got some going in the future, as Eileen mentioned. And we have two special guests here. Mm -hmm. We have, of course, Pat, Pat Hickey, Earl yeah. Hickey. He likes Pat. That's what we're going to call him by. And we have Ben Hickey. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Pat is going to be talking a little bit about the Everson Auction Barn. It used to be house in the old days. Yeah. And he's going to have some various other stories of him growing up and his potato farming. Mm -hmm. And so it's up to you, Pat. So... Okay. Let's start out. Well, first I want to thank the library, and I do use the library an awful lot nowadays. I can't read anymore. My eyesight's so bad. But I do the uh, Linden Library, and they have a real good selection of CDs there that I really do enjoy a lot. So that works out great for me right there at Linden. And, of course, the Everson Library here. I knew old Macbeth. In fact, he was my principal at the Everson Grade School <laughs> when I was growing up, so the Macbeth Library here. But yeah, we'll try starting in on the uh, <clears throat> Everson Livestock Market there. Originally, it was the Rotor School way back, and I tried to get a uh, little bit of information on when it started or how long it ran. The best I could come up with was... Uh, Albert Vincus was told to me that he uh, had gone to school there, uh, trying to add up numbers, but he is 89, and he said he went to that school till he was 14. So if he's 89, he was born in, uh, let me see if I got this right, 1929? Yeah, uh, that would put us up to 2018. Anyway, uh, 29, and he was 14 when he graduated, mm -hmm. so that would put the uh, uh, 1943, uh, if I've got those numbers right. So it was a school, Rotor School yet, in 1943, and my dad and I, well, we moved over there when I was eight years old at the house right across the street from the auction market. And it's known as the Stony Ridge Farms now out there. And we, that was our potato operation that we ran in there for several years. So somewhere in between uh, 43 and, let's see, we moved over there in 50, uh, 56. So... I'm not real sure when, uh, and as far as I know, the original auctioneer was a Bob Noble, Bob and Vitira, and they had, uh, they lived right there, they had a little apartment right inside the auction at that time, and I'm pretty sure he's the one that either bought the old school there, he must have, and then, uh, made it into an auction market, and, uh, and he ran it for a good many years. He was a really good neighbor right across the street. And uh, for an eight-year-old, as young as I was, just moving into the neighborhood, and uh, I remember, shoot, it wasn't a couple days that Bob and Vitera come walking across the street and introduce themselves. So we all got, got to know each other real quick. And uh, he's, uh, he's the one I'm sure that ran, I'm not real sure how long he ran the, mar the Everson Livestock Market there. But uh, it was a lot of fun for, uh, for myself, my brother, and uh, it was real entertaining every, every Saturday. We'd go over there and watch the market. So, I don't know if anybody's got any other questions on that, maybe how how long that uh, school was there, but that's as close as I could get, somewhere between uh, 43 and, and 56 when we moved over there. It was a pretty well-established uh, livestock 
auction it. I'm guessing it probably was at least 10 years running by the time we moved over there. So. Um, I had a question. Sure. Go ahead. I wondered um, when I heard the name Abbotsford, was that part of Canada for a while? Or? Abbotsford. Yeah, yeah, Abbotsford's a little town just right north of us here, north of Sumas. Just a little wink of the eye? Well, it actually it's pretty good size now already. Abbotsford. I'm not real sure what the population is up there, but it's an awful lot larger than Sumas. <laughs> yeah, there's a gosh, there's some big markets up there. At, uh, I thought what? Can I, excuse me. I yeah. thought what I interject here. Yeah. If you want to take a picture of this, John, this is a picture of the schoolhouse as it was over there, and today's picture. So maybe that will give you kind of a, mm -hmm. a look and see what, what it the really looked like. Look like. Yeah. When we first moved here, we, we could walk across the border. Nobody even knew we were there. Wow. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think nobody. <laughs> there at Sumas, yeah. So. Okay, John? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When did, did you, I should have got you first, when did you want to <laughs> play? Well, cool. right now, I guess. Let's do it right now, and we'll... Let's, let's get in a tune while Let's we get can. in a tune here. Let's do it. Yeah. This was written by Ivers down in Pike Street Market, and uh, he has international clams, clam chowder. He's known for his clam chowder. People like Burl Ives and uh, Woody Guthrie would hang out there in his restaurant, and he wrote this song, and it became an early state song one of our Washington State songs, and it mentions clams, that's the name of it, Acres of Clams, and clams were a big part of the homesteader's diet. I've traveled all over this country, prospecting and digging for gold. I've tunneled hydraulic and cradle. That's the only song I know, but I can play it all day. <laughs> That's what <I'm> <laughs> oh, 
I know, I know Ben was mentioning as we were ready to start here, boy, you, you have a history too as far as uh, I, I asked Ben to stay here because he knows a lot of things too that because you grew up together naturally. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, anyway, let's go back to where we were. You were talking about the auction the house. The livestock market, yeah. The market, it's called the market now. Well, Everson Livestock Auction Market, yeah, I believe that's okay. how they, yeah. And, uh, yeah, Bob Noble, as far as I know, he was the one that originated and got it started and going. He was quite the carpenter. He did a lot of carpentry work in there to switch that old school into a, because there's a lot, I don't know if any of you folks have been in there lately, but it's still the same old bleachers and uh, and the auction ring where they let the animals in and, and circle them around. And and, uh, and there's a big uh, area where the auctioneer is up on a stand up there, so he's up quite a bit higher and up away from the, the animals. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, it works out really good. They let them in one door and run them through a... Uh, there's a, uh, a scale there, so quite often they want to see what the weight of the animal is so they know how much to bid on them. And uh, so Bob Noble, and, and uh, I'm trying to remember, I know he's got, uh, I knew one of his daughters, I think he had three daughters. Uh, one of them was married to a Bartell, and that was Jack Bartell. She had, uh, between her and Jack, they had four children. And uh, yeah, there was Steve and Jackie and uh, and uh, Cindy and, and Bonnie. Patty, yeah, uh, the Bartels. I don't know. That was June Bartels, and then she had a sister, and her last name was Irely. There was two of the girls that were about the same age as, as us little guys running around there, but uh, that was the Irely girls, and then there was one other daughter. I think she was married to a pen, if I remember right. So, but I'm not real sure what the other, I know June Bartels was the one, one of the other daughter that was. Anyhow, that's about as most as I know about the the, the family, Bob's, Bob and Patera. And uh, they lived right there and, oh gosh, yeah, my folks got real acquainted with them because, of course, after the auction or any time where they, uh, they would have my folks over, they'd play Pinnacle and stuff together on the weekends there, so yeah, got real acquainted with them. So I guess I could uh, I could go into one of the stories that I've got about uh, my younger days and the experience at the, at the auction. I bet you bought a lot of animals from that auction barn. Well, yeah. We can, <laughs> what was the first animal you ever bought that you remember? Well, yeah, that would have to be, I, I'd have to go into the chicken story. Because, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I was sitting there one day, and I don't know, I had a couple dollars in my wallet. I thought I was pretty well set for the auction with a couple dollars. But anyhow, a, a box full of uh, hens came through. And there was eight nice red laying hens in that box. And I thought, by golly, if I could pick that and hens up, I could get into the chicken business. And, uh, I was eight years old at the time, so. Anyway, <clears throat> old Bob, he started the bidding in. He said, anybody give me a dollar for these hens? And so, well, shoot, that was pretty good. I raised my hand, yeah. Somebody else bid a dollar ten. So I had to go dollar twenty, dollar thirty. I went, man alive, how am I gonna get these hands up? I'm gonna jump right to a buck and a half. I said, <laughs> and uh, old Bob says, uh, going once, going twice, sold to Mister Hickey. Well, eight years old, and he called me Mister Hickey. <laughs> well, I mean, gee whiz, that's pretty good. So it's time to go pay for my hands. Well, I went up to the office and talked to Vatira. She said, yeah, I see you bought these uh, box of hens. There's eight hens in there. She says, that'll be $12. Uh -oh. Whoa, wait a minute. I only got $2 in my wallet. I thought I paid a dollar. Oh, she says, that's a uh, dollar and a half per hen. 
Oh, 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 oh. you got eight hens, that's twelve dollars. And now we're in trouble. <laughs> well, I went running across the street to Dad. I said, Dad, I, uh, I bought some nice land hens, but I'm going to have to borrow some money. Oh, okay. So I just need ten dollars. I got two dollars in my wallet. Well, I says, all right, make you a deal. You, uh, I'll give you the ten dollars, and you go bring them hens home. You take good care of them, water and feed. But the first ten dozen eggs have to go to the house. You got to pay that back for mom to house. Well, all right, I went over there and I got to thinking, my God, that's a pretty good deal for me. I eat most of the eggs at the house anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I goes over and I brings them hens home. And I got, and I was in the chicken business there with those eggs for quite a while. I was able to sell the neighbors some eggs once in a while. And I even got old Bob to buy a couple dozen once in a while from <laughs> Bob Noble over there. So that's the that's the chicken story <clears throat> about them hens, yeah, good red laying hens. Now, did you, what about the rabbits? Well, yeah, that's another little bit of a story because that was maybe another oh gosh maybe a year later or so. But anyhow, my brother and I were sitting together, and uh, that bunch of rabbits come through another big box of rabbits. I think there was six rabbits in that box. But anyway. Now, well, maybe we're getting a rabbit business here. And uh, so we got together on it, and we went to bidding on those rabbits. And gosh, I can't remember exactly what I paid for them, but I don't think there was, this was back in 1956 or 57. So uh, probably rabbits were going for 4 or $5 a piece at that time. I'm not real sure, but we brought those rabbits home and uh, cleaned up a nice, we, I had an old building there. It was about... 10 by 12, and uh, I just put those rabbits in there and not even bother to put them in a pen. So we grabbed a couple of bales of hay, good old Timothy hay, and fluffed it out around the corners. And uh, we took them rabbits home and threw them in there in that pen, and they disappeared under the hay. <laughs> Gosh sakes. Well, I know they're in there. <laughs> so we put some water out and put some feed out, and uh, sure enough, the feed would be missing every day. The water would go down. So, and, well, they're doing pretty good. They're hiding under all that hay in there. And, uh, oh gosh, I don't know, it was maybe two, three months later. We got to thinking, man, it's time to figure out where them, in, them rabbits took off to in there. So, time to change the hay around a little bit anyway. So. We took quite a bit of that old hay out, was going to put some fresh hay in there, and my gosh, the rabbits. Those little buggers really multiply. <laughs> I, we never did count them all, because I think there was a, at least 70 of them in there. Oh, my oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Just in a short amount of time. <laughs> so we put some fresh hay in there, and we let it go for another month or so, and we have it. And them little ones are getting pretty big, it's time to, so, you know, uh, we'd box up about six rabbits every week, take back to the auction. I don't think we would have ever run out of rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just kept multiplying, and we'd take six out, and another week later, another six are ready to go to the auction, and we was selling rabbits. <laughs> so, that's the rabbit story I got for you. No, you're yeah. talking about uh, 1956. Yeah, you bought the top 30 property. Can you uh, from? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. That was uh, the original owner of that property was uh, Art Brew, and I can't remember what his wife's name was right now. But anyhow, Art Brew had the top 30 acres, and at that time, my father was in uh, in partnership with the. Uh, uh, Johnson Brothers, they had their main farm over at Weiser Lake, and they were in the potato business. And uh, in 56, we moved over and bought that top 30 from Art Brew, and then my dad uh, finagled around and got uh, 40 acres of the bottom land. That was peat bog soil, real good potato ground down there. And uh, so we had 70 total there altogether. And 
on down below that was, uh, I don't know if you know where Scott Crick runs through the valley here. Starts at uh, Strandell and it runs on down through the valley clear out to Linden and actually dumps into the Nooksack River be uh, just east of the uh, Guide Meridian Bridge. Mm. Is that Scott Crick runs through there and it does a real good job of draining the soil <coughs> out through there. But yeah, we moved over there and got onto that property. Uh, my brother and I always had a real entertaining time. We'd sneak down to the creek and pull some six and eight inch trout, brook trout out of that creek once in a while. Wow. That's kind of another story because we got the bright idea one time, maybe we'll uh, see if we can get some of them brook trout to grow. We lived right across from the uh, uh, gravel pit was in there, an old gravel pit. Well, they'd gone in after they got most of the gravel hauled out of there, and uh, that'd be just uh, just west of where the auction bark there is. There's an old gravel pit. Somebody dug a big test hole in there and, and uh, had year-round water in it, and uh, we well, go catch some of them trout down to creek and uh, put them in that little pond in there. Well, we found an old milk can, so we took that on down to creek and. We was busy all afternoon putting trout in that milk can full of water. Those milk cans were pretty handy. They had a handle on each side, you know, so I could carry one half and brother could carry the other half. We did that for a whole, I don't know, three or four different times. We went down and caught a mess of fish and took that milk can up and dumped them fish into that pond up there. Well, it wasn't but, oh, next year around or so, we kind of forgot where them there was even fish in that pond. But uh, come around, by golly, we thought, man, maybe we ought to try that pond now and see if we can catch some fish out there. Sure enough, we was down there, we was catching uh, three and four pounders out of that, that little uh, pond that was in there. So how long a fish is that? <laughs> oh, oh gosh, yeah, three or four pound of trout. Yeah, they're, uh, oh gosh, 14, 18 inches, something like that, wow, I suppose. Wow, nice fish. Yeah. <laughs> I remember you had a tree house there. They used to dump the uh, county signs, you know, like stop signs and road signs. Oh, gosh. And they'd dump them in the gravel pit there. Oh, yeah. And you guys made a tree house out of that. Oh, God. And we'd had a raft that we'd... <laughs> raft around in the winter time it flood and we would raft out to that tree house and that was quite a tree house yeah we used to we used to spend a lot of time in that old gravel pit i don't know what's fascinating about being down in there and just just kicking around and doing things yeah we used to have a rafts and we was huck finn down there <laughs> I tell you, yeah, that was a great time <laughs> yeah, in the summer months, most of the water would evaporate away, or the, I think the water table goes up and down in that country a lot. As, uh, I remember Dad had a, we had a big irrigation <clears throat> well not too far, just across the street from that gravel pit, actually, and it had a big uh, three-foot cement casing, big round casing that went down. But I don't think it was that terrible deep. I think it only went down... Uh, well, Herman Ellingson brought his uh, well drilling out there and kind of fixed it up for us and put the well a little deeper because Dad wanted to be able to pull, oh, we were sprinkling at least 40 to 60 sprinklers at a time, put a big electric 25-horse uh, pump, pump in there, and we could uh, irrigate the whole 70 acres out of that one well. Wow. Uh, that was good water. Wow. Uh, wow. So... You yeah. never thought of it then, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we was irrigating grassland on the top, and quite often we had potatoes in the bottom 40, so, yeah. That was enough. Now, on potato farming, it says here 1956 to 86. Yeah. Yeah, that was the run that we had there. So that was the property that you're talking about there? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> no, we got up to where we was running... Uh, I went through college. Uh, ben and I actually went to college together down there at Skagit. Wow. We lived in the White House. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> I don't know if we should talk too much about that. <laughs> yeah. What went on in the White House? Uh, <laughs> Pat brought spuds and I lived on a dairy farm, so I brought milk. <laughs> Our roommates were glad to see us. <laughs> we fed them all. <laughs> back when we was 19 and 20 years old, so things were kind of 
pretty wild around Pleasant. there. At times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did you have a total of how many acres of, of potatoes did you have? Well, on we, the we got up, actually, we got up to where we were running about 100 to 120 acres because we had, we had that 40, and then we, we were all over the neighborhood looking for fresh ground. You can't grow potatoes but two years in a row. It, it takes so much out of the soil. So you got to rotate your crops a lot. Well, now, where did the potatoes go? We had a, a regular sales system. Yeah, we had, uh, well, Dad had started with the Johnson brothers way back early, and they took all the potatoes right into Bellingham, and uh, they'd haul them in there. And then when I got going into the system, when I got out of college, we, uh, we had a two-day, I delivered potatoes on Mondays and Thursdays, or Mondays and Fridays, I think it was, get it through the weekend, but uh, twice a week we'd take, uh, oh, we had a route truck that would haul uh, eight ton, and uh, quite often I'd get a little overloaded with 10 ton of spuds on there, but <laughs> yeah. uh, get them into Bellingham. We had uh, all the uh, Thriftway markets were uh, going. Oh, okay. Yeah, so then at times we had, uh, we'd go down into Everett, we'd get, sell some spuds down there, yeah, and uh, Arnell yeah. and Linden. Yeah, all, okay. the, all the area around here. Most of the restaurants, we had baked potatoes. We had put them in cardboard boxes, bakers for the restaurants. Seems so like all you had a lot of good things good. going. And you didn't get uh, yeah. in any trouble with the government or anything like that. Oh, it made. was all, yeah, USDA inspected. Yeah, we oh. had uh, most of our potatoes went out in 10-pound uh, plastic bags. Yeah, we had a regular bagging equipment set up, and oh, okay. we could bag them up and ship them out. Yeah. Did so, you get a uh, disease or? You get what? Did they get a disease? Oh or? gosh, yeah, potatoes. Yeah, you got to fight the blight, and you got to fight the uh, aphids all the time. Yeah, we yeah. we had a sprayer system on a on a wagon and a pull with a tractor, and uh, we could spray uh, ten rows at a time. It had big wings on it. Oh, okay. And, uh, yeah, we'd go. We have to go through the fields, though. About every 10 days during the growing season, you'd have to go through, especially with the fungicide to kill the, uh, kill the blight spores. Okay. Boy, it really gets complicated. I thought it was so nice and... Easy and toss a potato into the sack. <laughs> 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 Sorry, rabbits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what, you're, what, I, what I was thinking, yeah. I, all of us is probably eaten Hicks family potatoes or uh, whatever. We were known at that time as Wiser Lake potatoes. We had a brand name and everything going on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wiser Lake brand potatoes. Oh, okay. I remember seeing yeah. sacks. Yes. 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 Did you bump into the wall? Yes. So... Uh, um, no, in, uh, yeah, 86, yeah, we had a couple of bad crop years, so the bank decided we shouldn't uh, try to go any longer. They thought they'd better, yeah, uh, when you get into that big of acreage and stuff, it cost us real close to $1,000 an acre to get the crop started before you ever get a return on it. So quite an investment. Yeah. In you never know how it's going to turn out. Yeah, it's kind of a gamble. Yeah, I was a few times I thought I might as well just go on down to Reno. And <laughs> <laughs> do, do better then, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go to Ireland first and see what happened to them. Yeah, yeah, the Irish, yeah. Now, you mentioned here that you bought the Kale property in 1971? Yeah, yep. That was, uh, yeah, when I was in the partnership with my dad. See, I went, uh, I graduated at Nicksack in 67, and then I graduated out of Skagit College in 69, uh, and then I got married in 70, and uh, wow. I bought that property out uh, just across the river from us here, uh, the old Kale property. Okay. And it was, uh, they said it was 93 acres in there, but I there was so much of that ground that was, corners and a lot of it alongside the river and stuff. I think there was pretty close to 70 acres that I actually could put into potato production okay. there. Okay. That sounds backbreaking. Wow. Yeah. Well, we ran a pretty good bunch of beef animals all the time, Dad and I. We usually had 30, 30 or 40 head of beef cows because there was a lot of cull potatoes that we ended up with every year, so we, <laughs> yeah, we could feed the culls to the cows. So you bought the... Bought a, was it, what, Howard Graham? Howard Graham, 
Yeah, he uh, originally owned, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure how many hands that went through. I don't know if, who uh, Howard bought the property from, but uh, yeah, it was originally the Kale property. Uh, from what I understand, they started the Kale cannery uh, with uh, prunes. And when I moved onto that property, there was still a line of prune trees. It was probably about, oh, 10 or 15 okay. prune trees still on the property, but they were pretty well used up and old, and I ended up tearing them all out. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. You and your brother Mike were into the seed potatoes there for a time, too, yeah, weren't you? Brother Mike got into, you know, Mike went through Vietnam, and when he came back home from Vietnam, yeah. He got started into the uh, seed potato production, and uh, yeah, he was doing pretty good there for a while too. And uh, but he ended up on uh, Bun Harriman had a piece of property. I think that was 40 acres over on the uh, Mission Road, and Mike bought that piece of property and he got the working potatoes in there. But there was uh, just about more rocks than potatoes in that ground. <laughs> ended up hauling a lot of rocks too so he said well the heck with this and we're going to the uh, gravel pit business so he started uh, digging a hole and making a gravel pit and that was a whole lot more lucrative for him okay. what did he grow more prunes wow rocks rocks oh yeah <laughs> yeah, all you got to do is dig a hole and find the rocks over there. <laughs> no sprays. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that worked Don't out. Don't got a weed. I remember picking them weeds in the hot sun cell. Oh. And no matter how, how hard we tried, it was never good enough. At the end of the day, somebody would come down there. I thought you guys came over here to work. <laughs> you just out here lollygagging around. <laughs> Weeds yeah. <laughs> and potato fights in the barn. <laughs> oh God! Now you used to. You mentioned that you used to throw potatoes at each other. Is that what you <laughs> oh, said? God. Yeah, I had regular little forts where you could dodge down and, and run over a, <laughs> a you know run away 10, 20 feet and then okay. pop up someplace else and nail somebody. Yeah. Oh, those spuds hurt. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, well, now I see here that. Let's go back to the school. School teachers. Um, of yeah. course, had to be single in the Hickey house. Well, what's the yeah, story on that? That when we bought that property from Art Brew, uh, I forget how the story got going, but Art always told us that he kept the uh, school marms, the school ladies, the teachers upstairs in that house. Now, there was four bedrooms up there, and there was what we called a great room or a playroom that was a big room. They, could have put four beds in that room by itself but anyhow I'm not sure how many teachers they had across there at that rotor school but uh, I always understood yeah that uh, the teachers stayed there at there at that house and then uh, all they had to do was walk across the street and get the school going every day now you talked about a big <clears throat> house what do you mean by that how big? Well, that house is still there. I think it's probably, uh, it was a three-story house. It had a full basement and then uh, the main up, uh, kitchen and living room and all that. And there was a, a bedroom in that. And then, and then there was four bedrooms upstairs. And that's a house that I was raised in from eight till I was uh, 21, I guess. I moved out of there when I got married. Yeah. Do you know when it was uh, built? Oh, gosh. No, I don't. We have a date on that, I don't think. It's still there, right across from the auction. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. somebody knows. Um, yeah. And it says you housed at least four teachers. Yeah, there must have been. Yeah, there was four main that. bedrooms upstairs. So, okay. So, yeah, room for, for four. What's that real old-looking uh, building on I-9 that they're recovering it somehow now? But it's 1830 something. Oh, that could be. But it's be. right on the railway line. Be oh. easy for the potato farmer. Yeah, yeah. There was a there was quite a few potato farmers in uh, years ago. It's uh, they're pretty well thinned out. While well, the the main production in potatoes in Whatcom County is all seed potatoes now. There's mm -hmm. no. Uh, no, we were the last commercial growers here in Whatcom County, my dad and I. 
and uh, all your uh, anything that you buy out of the grocery store now for uh, for consumption is coming up out of Skagit County or Eastern Washington. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Patrick. Yeah. The property just south of your place there, the old Kell property, there used to be a cannery right there that they just renovated. What cannery was that? The Kale Cannery right across the river there, right? Yeah, it's right here in Everson, you mean? No, the one just south of your property. South. Just Wait. there by Strandale. Well, he oh, used to oh. the potatoes. Oh, yeah, you're talking about Fritzberg's warehouses there, I think. Yeah. Yeah, there's that warehouse is still there, but it yeah it was originally built by uh, one of the Fritzbergs, and they had potatoes in there, and that was a seed potato production that they did there in those warehouses. Now Fritzberg sold out to uh, Pete Van Dyke, and he ran potatoes there for several years also. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a city girl. I don't know what are seed potatoes. Seed potatoes. <laughs> Actually, they're exactly the same thing as an eating potato, regular table potato. The only difference is, is uh, they have the seed potatoes have to rogue, what they call they rogue their fields, and they walk through the fields and make sure there's no diseased plants. And if there's a disease that they can spot, they have to pull that plant out of the field. And uh, seed production is is uh, pretty intricate because. Whenever they sell their the seed potato to the commercial grower, then uh, he wants to the commercial grower wants to make sure that his his seed is not going to go rotten or uh, give him any troubles when he plant the plant the seed in the ground. But basically, it's the same uh, russet boy. Oh, you can buy all different varieties of potatoes for seed, you know. But uh, and then of course uh, nowadays. Uh, the uh, commercial growers will put a uh, what they call a sprout inhibitor on the potato so that it won't sprout when it gets to the grocery store. Is and, that uh, some kind of liquid? Yeah, it's a, uh, oh boy, I never did like to deal with that kind of chemical stuff, but uh, USDA inspected and everything is all supposed to be fine and dandy, but I read on the label one time without sprout inhibitor, it says it stops cell division. I didn't like the sound of that at all. Yeah, but that's apparently what they use because uh, Mrs. Housewife doesn't like to buy a potato in the grocery store with any sprouts on it. Yeah, so. But, uh, yeah, I heard they're kind of poisonous to to eat the sprout. Well, yeah, sprouts themselves aren't really that uh, good f good for you with potato sprouts anyway. Alfalfa sprouts are good for you, I understand. But uh, yeah. yeah. So you, the main potato, did you, was it russet that you had? Yeah, okay. russet Burbank and then, Burbank. Uh, yeah. Okay. There was a few different varieties that we played with. We could, uh, there's a, uh, uh, we called a Norgold back in those days. I'm not sure if that's even available anymore, but uh, <clears throat> we had Norgold potato variety was what we call a 90 day variety. And you could plant it and uh, 90 days later, you could harvest that potato. It was an early variety. Okay. Now, the russet Burbank is 120 day uh, for maturity from the day you plant till the day you can harvest and get a fair sized potato. Wow. So, yeah, that's the main difference there. Of course, the earlier you could get a crop off it, there was a few times when we actually could harvest uh, just after the 4th of July and uh, get a good market price for an early potato right out of the okay. ground. Yeah. Interesting. Everybody I knew loved those early potatoes. Yeah. yeah, early variety of potatoes. We tried a few red potatoes at times, but I don't know, it's in Whatcom County doesn't seem to like, back in those days anyway, we never did Not have a whole selling. lot of luck selling red potatoes. Hmm. Everybody wanted the white russet Burbank. Okay. So is Bedlington Farms, it's just seed potatoes? Yep, Bedlington's are all seed potatoes. Yeah, Dick Bedlington and Dale when... Bedlington, that have been that way from day one, yeah. yeah. So I can't figure out, I, I don't even remember, because it was 1980, but I worked on the back of a potato harvester, and I don't know who I worked for. I wonder if I worked for you. <laughs> oh, well, it could be, 1980. Because you said uh, you went through 1986, right? Yeah, yeah. Those big old potato harvesters, though, we were out there for 12 hours a day, and when you get off of them, they, it's... A conveyor belt and it just rocks and everything you get off you practically fall over because you're yeah, yeah you're used to seeing those <laughs> potatoes yeah but i remember 
they would towards the end of the harvest they try and go into the dark even and you know we're yeah. supposed to be sorting through these potatoes on a conveyor belt in the dark you know <laughs> <laughs> get your hole on that one yeah. Yeah. but yeah no that was that was what I that was some work we did when we first came out here because we what, what was your last name Waters Waters no I don't recognize yeah. the yeah, you lived here in Whatcom County all your life? Uh, yeah, I lived in Whatcom County since 1977. 77. But came out here in 1980. And while we were building our house, we could only really work part-time. So okay. we moved there. Yeah. I remember yeah. it was 12 hour days. It was something else. Oh, yeah. And at harvest time, yeah, you got to go. Yep. You got to go hit it hard, mm -hmm. get the crop in the, in the warehouse. Did you want to tell another story? Uh, uh, Dave and Dwayne Lickle? Yeah, that's uh, it's kind of a tearjerker. That's okay. Uh, yeah, you got to be prepared for this one because uh, uh oh, my brother spent uh, his time over in Vietnam, and uh, Steve Quinn sitting here, he spent his time over in Vietnam, and uh, that wasn't really very much of a party. I'm kind of we're glad, aren't we, Ben, that we kind of missed out on that party. I lucked out. Yeah, I felt pretty good about that too, really, but. Uh, I'm sure glad that uh, the we guys had uh, uh, three of our families: Uncle David, Uncle and Dave was over Mike there, and brother Joe. Mike. That's three of them. So, yeah, the story about the Lickle family. Now he had a big dairy just uh, south, well, no, west of us, there, next door neighbors, just across the fence, and always a really good neighbor. But uh, my brother just got back from Vietnam, <clears throat> and. Uh, we were working around the warehouse there, and, and my brother was helping us out that day, and and Dave Lickle come walking into the warehouse, and uh, walked right up to my brother Mike and shook his hand, says, uh, thanks very much for the time you spent in Vietnam and serving our country, and he uh, shook his hand and really was, said he was proud that my brother Mike had made it home because... Uh, we just heard that week that uh, David's son, Dwayne Luckle, had, had didn't make it home from Vietnam. So that was, boy, I tell you, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't work the spud shed the rest of the day. We just had to shut it down. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a real, boy, the Luckle family, they really took it rough, too, because, okay. yeah. Did I get that straight? Did this hand get cut off? Mm -hmm. No, he was killed in Vietnam. Oh. Yeah. Do we need to go to the a little lighter side here, the fishing story? Yeah. Unless that, you had something more to add? No, that okay. was... Okay. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, I was just going to thank Steve here for oh, spending time in Vietnam for us, too. Okay. Yeah, he put in his time over there, and so... Did you do a nice memorial service, or did you go to a memorial service for him? For Dwayne Lickle? Yes. Uh, no, I don't remember going to a service for him, but uh, boy, the whole neighborhood felt that one because, uh, yeah, we all knew he was over there and spending his time, and yeah, we heard that he didn't make it home, so. Okay. Yeah. No, the fishing story, that was pretty well what, uh, what, yeah, my brother and I would go down there to Scott Creek and bring those trout up and put them in the pond, and. By golly, a couple of years later, we were pulling some nice-sized trout out of that pond. Okay. So <laughs> that was, was that part yeah. of the story that you said earlier then? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. I yeah. was just checking. Yeah. Yeah. The fish. Did you have something to add, Ben? How about the pigs? You raised a lot of potatoes, and sometimes they'd get a little bit oh, rotten, okay. and you needed something to eat those potatoes. Yeah. Maybe they weren't always rotten. They just maybe had a blemish on them, and so the, yeah. it seemed like, I don't know if you cooked those potatoes before you fed them. Yeah, and then uh, I remember going in there in the winter time in that big barn, and and uh, they had a section there where uh, the pigs were in there, and we knew they were in there, but they, it was so full of straw, about oh, a foot yeah. layer deep of straw, oh. and it was kind of cold. The old northeast oh. east wind was blowing and it's snowing, and you go inside that barn and you don't see a pig or hear a squeal and. Then you shut the door and you rattle a grain bucket, and all of a oh sudden, boy. man, just hundreds of pigs come running out of that straw, and heading for the, heading for the feed bank there. Yeah, that was <laughs> remember those pigs? You raised pigs for quite a while. Some of the earlier times, I forget. I think Dad had uh, six 
uh, there's six or eight sows going at that time. Wow. And uh, <laughs> if you uh, rotate your sows right, you can get three batches. Of, actually, uh, <laughs> how's that work now? It's uh, three months, three weeks, and three days from conception till you get a batch of pigs. So if you rotate your sows right, you can get five litters in two years. And uh, wow. so if each sow is kicking out uh, oh, 10 to 12 pigs at least, some of them can maybe 14 or 16 even sometimes. But if you got, yeah, six sows, uh, even averaging 10, that's, uh, that's 60 <laughs> pigs. And then, uh, yeah. So you, what, you sold them then? Yeah, there was a BB so, meat and sausage in Bellingham okay. that would uh, yeah, took all the pork that we could uh, produce okay. for them there. And uh, yeah, that cooking potatoes worked real good for pigs. They just loved cooked potatoes. And uh, <laughs> there was uh, old Herm oh, Veltheisen. He, uh, oh my gosh, don't tell me. I, I better shut that thing off. Man, why we don't need to be interrupted by that one. There. <laughs> So anyway, O'Hearn Velleis and he moved over, he came over from the Netherlands, Holland, and uh, he had some money stuck over there, and uh, they wouldn't let him bring cash over, but he could buy equipment or bring things over. Well, uh, he, uh, Dad got to talking to him and cooking potatoes for these pigs, and he brought over from Holland a uh, cooker and it run on either wood or coal and it was a big thing because it had uh, I think there was two big you had to operate it with a tractor two big bucket things and it cooked with steam and so dad went out there behind the barn and made this pit thing and he filled that full of potatoes cooked potatoes in the, in the fall and uh, all winter long, it's, you go out there with a shovel and you slice it off just like cheese and load up the wheelbarrow and feed the pigs. And uh, it was a big steam cooker that they brought over hmm. from all. I don't know what ever happened to that thing. I don't know if Ben ever remembers seeing that thing, but boy, it was no, quite the operation. I don't remember it. Yeah. Hmm. So steam potatoes for the pigs, and then, of course, you feed them a little green, and those pigs grow fast. Yeah. Lots of pigs. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions so far? The Go ahead. The question about um, uh, the workers, you mentioned that there was a lot of work and and nowadays I we, I see migrant workers coming all the way up from Mexico to get, and I, I don't know when that started, but um, did you use migrant workers? No, no, not so much back in those days. Uh, there was a quite a few of the uh, uh, Nooksack Indians that we'd uh, bring on the uh, bring on the farm during harvest time. Uh, we could pretty well run the operation. Uh, it was springtime planting. And we needed extra help, and then especially in the fall time when we were harvesting, we'd bring in awesome. oh eight or ten. My gosh, why that thing won't quit? Come on, get out of there! Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, we'd bring in extra help and uh, during harvest time, oh, usually about, oh, six or eight extra fellas. And uh, Dad would go into Bellingham and uh, it was, uh, what the heck was the name of that where you could get extra help coming out of Bellingham, but yeah, unemployment office. Yeah, so. Well, Patrick, I know, uh my family worked for you for a bit, and you guys were really good to us and fed some really good potatoes. Some of the best French fries you could ever have growing up in the country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, Patrick, yeah, tell me yeah. about your dad's feeling about a straw hat. Straw hat? Oh, yeah. I think you'll have to tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'd have the right story about hats with my dad. He had all kinds of different hats he wore. No, the st big straw hat? Yeah. And my... My, I used to work with Pat. What's your name, by the way? So. Steve Quinn. Okay. And I used to work, I, I'd work with uh, number mill and stuff like that. So I did, uh, and I'd get laid off work, and so I'd okay. get filled in there. And <coughs> we'd be out there in the harvesters and stuff, uh, potato diggers. 
-hmm. And we went, and one day, you know, it was, it was real hot. And my wife had a big straw hat on. And he, his dad <coughs> did not like that straw hat. He said, every time somebody wears a darn straw hat, it begins to rain. <laughs> <laughs> He made, he made it take it off. He, went, he, he threw that thing in the truck and wouldn't let it wait worth the rest of the day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I could remember that story. Wow. <laughs> no, that sounds like Uncle Earl. Yeah. <laughs> now, you mentioned that you had a granddaughter story. Yeah. <coughs> well, yeah, that's... Uh, well... I heard this one over the radio, but I always really enjoyed it, but I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> so I just personalized it a bit. My granddaughter and I were sitting together one afternoon there, and we were discussing uh, family problems and world events and all kinds of important stuff like that with a five-year-old, you know. <laughs> so, anyhow, she was checking me out and watching me, and she said, uh, finally, she said, Grandpa, you're looking mighty old. She said, you got wrinkly skin and you're going bald and gray hair and you're just looking really old. And uh, I, I thought about that. Well, I said, yeah, yeah, that's right, really. I mean, uh, see, I'm, I'm 70 years old. That means uh, God made me 70 years ago. That's a long time, way back. And see, God only made you five years ago, so that's why you're so young and pretty. And uh, she got to thinking about that, and she was watching me, and she, finally she says, well, she says, God sure is doing a lot better job of making people now than he did back in your day. granddaughter story <laughs> what they don't come up with <laughs> is there any is there anything else you wanted to add on our any of our other stories or anything mm -hmm. otherwise uh, are we getting close to time to shut her well, down here huh? does anyone have any questions could you by the way ben could you do another one for us oh gosh yeah I or not know. or would you rather not Mm. Uh, you mean right now? <laughs> yeah. If you want to, otherwise you can do the same one again. I don't care. I'm just asking. Well, I remember a story. See, I grew up on a dairy farm. We were about, what, uh, 12 miles apart from where you're talking. Yeah. I grew on a whole road and west side of the guide by one mile. And I remember Uncle David used to come over and he had a horse, Dusty, that had been run in the Linden Fair uh, as racing. And they said, once you race a horse, they're ruined. <laughs> that that's all they want to do is race. They want to run, yeah. And so there were several horses, and I always appreciated the names of these horses. That horse was called Dusty. And then there was another one called Red Feather. And then there was another one called Sunset. And you could ride Red Feather and Sunset pretty reasonably. But we were warned, don't get on Dusty. And, of course, that's the first thing you want to do is get on the one that you told not to get on. Yeah. So my brother Joe got on there, and he says, come on up. This horse is tame. You know, we'll do all right with this. So I got on there. Bam! That horse just took off the minute I got on there. Mm. And he's heading for home. We had had little trails around the neighbor's woods there that kind of ran in circles, and we'd play tag and that sort of thing. And Dusty headed for home. And we are just going. I'd never been so fast on a horse. And, well, what do we do? You know, I'm starting to bounce and starting to kind of go off to the side there. And Joe says, stand up. So, okay. Stand up. So I stood up on the horse and hung on to his shoulders. <laughs> and then I'm really bouncing around. And didn't, didn't stop the horse any at all. And, what do I do now? Jump off! <laughs> so I jumped off and I just rolled in the dust and the dirt. It was pretty soft right there. Luckily for that. <laughs> and the horse immediately stopped. Mm. And Joe's up there just laughing his head off. You know, ha, ha, ha. That's my horse story. Uh, did you ever get a? Did, one? Go ahead. Was was that your last horse you got on her? <laughs> no, we. One time, uh, you mentioned some uh, migrant people, and well, 
uh, these actually weren't migrant people, but they were of a Hispanic origin, and they came over, and they're kind of shy about horses, or they have a history of, you know, really being good cowboys and that sort of thing. But these guys were a little shy, so one day we got a uh, sunset out there, and my brother had a, a quirk, they call it, or it, it's a type of a whip. That as long as that horse didn't see that whip, it was all right, and you could tap him on the flank. But if you held that out in front of his eye and he saw that quirk, <coughs> he would freak out. And so we, all three of us, got up on top of that horse, and the little guy was in front of me, and the big guy was behind me, and I was in the middle. And the little guy up front said, give me the quirk, give me the quirk. All right, I'll let you have the quirk. And he made the mistake of putting that quirk out in front of the horse, and the horse just, I don't know exactly what he did. It's kind of like a shudder. Uh, it jumped up in the air and shuddered all at the same time. And their heads came back and back. And I was right in the middle. And I just, <laughs> bam, all three of us fell off. <laughs> That's another horse, horse story. <laughs> Man, my head hurt for <laughs> days. <laughs> Did you did you have anything else to add? Uh, oh gosh, yeah. horse stories! I can go into that for a long time. But, uh, Our family's always had horses. I guess Grandpa used to have a, a what was it, a six or eight horse team that he uh, yeah, delivered hay okay. to the uh, Linden Stage. Yeah. The Linden Stage was in Bellingham. Uh, it ran yeah. from Bellingham to Linden, and he would yeah. deliver hay there. Yeah. Mom always told me that, that by, by the end of the day, after he got that hay loaded up and the horses into town and he would be coming back home, that he fell asleep in the in the wagon. And the guide breeding at that time was enclosed by trees. And the horses knew the way home. And he would sleep on the way home. <laughs> and all you could see was the skyline there and all the rest was woods. Well, so drive down the guide now. <laughs> that was one of the things, but... And then horses, that first horse, we remember that, we called him Major. It was a big old paint horse. I think it was half draft horse. It had great big feet. Hmm. And he was a pretty tall horse, but one of the first horses I learned to ride on. But he was a hard-mouthed horse. And uh, my gosh, get on that horse. And if he grabbed a hold of that bit with his mouth, you could not control him. And uh, we had some low trees. And the first thing he'd do is head for a tree and swipe me off. <laughs> So you always had, did you always have horses then? On Nearly the all, yeah. I Pretty remember much. having horses from way back when we was younger. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, Grandpa used to have great big work horses. Yeah. And he was clearing land at the time. And, and the deal was you'd mm. clear all summer long and, and spring and, and then pile them up in windrows and burn them in the fall. Mm -hmm. And us kids would go over there and, and ride some of his regular horses and then he had these draft horses. Mm. The draft horses kind of had a different gait to them. They kind of hopped instead of running and they would hop, 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 hop. And you could actually stand up on the back of them and control the reins and everything and they were big broad horses so you weren't going to get thrown off and they weren't very fast but they did that hopping and we'd play tag, you know, you can't touch the ground and, and we'll touch each other and you're it and da da da. Mm. And on the back of those uh, workhorses, you could stand up and see over those brush piles that were made in windrows. And you could tell where anybody else was. And one of the ways that we could tell, those draft horses always had a kind of a steam that came off of them. They, oh, okay. they sweated and steamed. And you look out over, oh, there's steam coming up over there. Somebody's <laughs> on a draft horse over there. <laughs> That's how we had sighted in each okay. other playing yeah. tag. Yeah, we used to play a lot of tag on horses. I remember doing that, yeah. You've been learning to join the circus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been told that I had an uncle that uh, joined the circus, and he was a roper. That he could, was quite good at the ropes, you know, could, okay. could jump through it and circle around and all that sort of thing. Uncle Jack. Yeah. And Grandpa tried to teach me. He just laughed at me. <laughs> tried to teach me how to do the, the roping, and I, I never could catch on. <laughs> it's an art. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we had an uncle who was, he was circus quality. Yeah, he <laughs> ran away to the rodeo. Oh, he could spin music. a rope clear around him and the horse and everything. Wow. Yeah. How about music in your family? Are you the only musician? Or what got you into playing the banjo? Mm. Uh, well, he I got a late start. I didn't start playing until I was 21. And 
Uh, Hee Haw was on, and I saw Grandpa Jones on oh, there, yeah. and I liked that. <laughs> I thought it was funny. And Earl Scruggs. And so I, I liked the sound of the banjo. And uh, a friend of mine, Johnny Monty, he was uh, the high school band leader, and the band instructor just kind of turned the class over to him because he could play clarinet and trombone and all, everything in the band, piano. And, and he would come over with an acoustic guitar, and he played mm. guitar and sang folk songs. And I thought, wow, that's really neat. I'd like to do that. And so I went to buy a guitar. Man, I couldn't reach across the fretboard. Okay. And it, it was uh, Mr. Fisher up at Western there, and he says, kind of a... a brusque old German fellow, and he kind of grabs me and shakes me, and he says, you play banjo. <laughs> and, and he said, so I bought a banjo from him. <laughs> Been at it ever since. So did you teach, were you self-taught? Yeah, I've got a whole library at home of uh, books. I, I learn by sight, which a lot oh, of people okay. look down their nose at me, you know, you learn by sight. <laughs> Something wrong with you? <laughs> And I got a tin ear. I can't really accompany other people where other people can hear a song. I play with a guitar player who can hear a song one time and he can play it exactly. Wow. Man, I can't do that. Play it by <laughs> There's ear. There's people yeah. out there that do that. <laughs> mm. Wish I was one of them. Well, I'd like to hear you play. Yeah, are you going to play another song? Play another well, I'd have to retune. I, but it. <laughs> Yeah, we do awful long. Strike Should we out. end it with another song then? Sure, I think. Unless you have something to say, let's do it. Okay. Yeah. We can okay. Do that. Uh, uh, yeah, I've been been over dark. Yeah, we used to go down to the river there and have a little camp out around the Fourth of July when its weather was good. When's the next one? When's the next one? We can come. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.